Hello, everyone, and welcome to the virtual edition of our year-round member screening series, Film Independent Presents. My name is Alexander Greer. I am a filmmaker and alumni of Film Independence LA Film Festival and a massive fan of the word huzzah. Uh, before we get started, I need to give a special mention to our incredible lead sponsor, the Hollywood Foreign Press Association, and our virtual screening partner, Vision Media. Um, so nominated for Emmys in Outstanding Directing and Outstanding Writing for a Comedy Series, The Great is a delightfully turbulent roller coaster ride that follows a young idealistic outsider named Catherine, who goes on to ascend to the highest position of power in 18th century Russia and lay claim to the title of the show, Becoming Catherine the Great. And we're here today with writer, creator, executive producer, uh, a man with excellent taste in shirts, uh, Oscar nominated uh, uh, Tony McNamara. Tony, hi. Hi, how are you? I'm, I'm fantastic. I feel a lot more comfortable now that I see that we uh, dress in the I exact know. same way. Yeah, we <laughs> psychically linked through yeah. shirts. Also, excellent uh, taste in glasses. I feel like uh, maybe we're just in a time loop. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so um, I'll be totally honest with you. Going into watching this, I knew nothing about Catherine the Great beyond the infamous rumor around her death. Uh, yeah. And if you would have asked me just how relevant and relatable 18th century Russian history is to today, I'm not quite sure how I would have answered that. Um, but Catherine's story, as you've told it, is just so engaging and uh, surprisingly accessible and undeniably relevant to today's world. I mean, you even, um, you even get to touch on the anti-vax movement. In yeah, I know. <laughs> um, so I wanna know like how you first came across the history and what was the moment where you knew that this would make for a story that you wanted to share with the world? Um, well, it was a play first. I, I think uh, I was looking for, I'd written maybe four or five contemporary plays and the head of a uh, Sydney theatre company is a, was a great actor and she wanted, she was, wanted me to write her a play uh, for her as the lead. And, uh, and I'd written contemporary plays for a while and I was like, oh, I want to do something different. And then I just, I think I just chanced upon a tiny little piece about Catherine the Great. Maybe it was a doco, I can't even remember. Um, and there was something about it that I just thought, oh, that's an inch, and a young woman who comes and takes over a country that's not her own. It, that seems kind of an interesting idea. And, um, and that was the start of it. And then I was just like, and then, you know, how do I make a period thing? And how do I write something like that? So I would like it. Uh, so, so it just started with the character. I just thought she seemed like a really interesting character. Um, and that, you know, that's usually the basis for something good. Most definitely. Yeah. Um, did you, did you research? Like, did, did you spend a lot of time delving well, into the historical fact? I didn't, I, I mean, I didn't like go, I mean, I did a bit, but um, I think with the play, um, which was the start of it, I, I did a bit. And then I was also aware that um, I had certain prejudices against historical drama. And one was the, that they just became a history lesson and that, um, you know, you were taking facts that were, that were sort of written down hundreds of years ago or interpreted. So you were sort of looking at interpreted facts anyway, and I didn't want to be driven by the, the detail in a way. I didn't want the show to get, I didn't want, a, a dramatist's job is to create event and drama and all these things. And I didn't want that to be hijacked by polite historical detail that probably wasn't even true. So I think initially I did enough and then I thought, oh, let's just go with the essence. What do I think is the essence of this character? Because that's the story I'm telling. And if the facts shore that up, then great. And if they don't, I don't really care about them, you know. I, and also I was trying to create a style that um, was sort of be, sort of would work in a contemporary sense because in my head I was sort of writing a contemporary story wrapped in big dresses and carriages, you know. So mm -hmm. I wasn't that like, you know, I was a bit like, well, if you want a history lesson, go read a history book. Don't come and watch a TV show. 
Sure. I mean, in all your title cards, you have an asterisk uh, yeah. next to the title. This is a, an occasionally true story. Yeah, yeah. Um, let, let's talk about that style that you've honed. Because, um, I mean, most of your prior work takes place in contemporary times, but with this one-two punch of the favorite and the great, you've kind of become this uh, prominent figurehead in, in, yeah. in revolutionizing how film and television can approach historical stories. Um, I mean, like one of my favorite lines I was reading back uh, from the show was uh, when Nicholas Holtz Peter says, uh, we will still make an heir. I do it now, but I just blew my bag on Madame Dimov. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's his favorite line. Um, it's, it's great. Like, I was, even just reading it, it makes me laugh again. Um, but, okay. Yeah, I, style, yeah I, think that, I think that was it. I mean, when I wrote the play, I experimented a lot with the style with the language of how I wanted to make it in a way as basic as I was like, how would I, what would make me like this? Someone who doesn't really like that many period things. I mean, I like Dangerous Liaisons and Barry Lyndon and Madness of King George and things like that. But there's a lot that I don't like. It's too polite. It's too mannered. It, it, there's something about, I, I just was like, how do I make this feel visceral? Like, like you're not looking back at something. Mm -hmm. So you, it, which would distance the audience. It was very much like, how do I make it feel like now? And how do I, but still make it feel period. So I was just like finding this idiom that was, you know, I was just creating a sort of anachronistic kind of contemporary kind of period thing that everyone could, could do and would make the, let the audience, let a contemporary audience into it in a very present way. Well, yeah, I mean, you certainly achieved that goal. Like it makes something that could otherwise be so esoteric uh, seem incredibly accessible. Uh, yeah. and makes these uh, historical figures humans, which I think is frequently lost when we read history. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, so I want to say on this topic of, of you, like sort of divorcing um, the story from its historical foundation sometimes. Um, and I want to I want to talk a little bit about uh, the casting specifically because you've yep. um, assembled a very multi ethnic cast to play 18th century Russian nobles. Yeah, I was wondering if you could talk on that and what what the ideas and intentions were behind that. Um, I think the idea was it just makes sense. To, it doesn't. I don't. It just makes sense to me to have a diverse cast. In I mean, you're writing about human beings in the world and the world is a diverse place. So, um, so on one level, it's just that. I think one of the writers, one of our more intellectual writers terms it post history. But I think for me, it was like, it just makes sense. I don't know why you, um, and, and I think some of, one of the writers ended up doing some historical background and found there were different races in the court. And of course, and that's the thing, history is just told by whoever. So, um, so I think that was it. And, and I think on a more personal level, uh, you know, I grew up in theatre and there's, you, you see great actors who don't get a shot, you know, who reach, and, and even, you know, Sasha, who plays Orlo, when he came into audition, he, you know, he said, I never get put up for things like, you know, I never get a, a shot at things like this because of the perception of it has to be white because it's 17th century or whatever. And, you know, I just, uh, I just, felt like you know it's it's just you know what it should be you know it wasn't like a massive uh thinking process really yeah well it's uh, an excellent result and really uh, brings humanity to the characters which is fantastic to watch uh speaking of characters i've heard you describe yourself as a character driven writer which is on full display in the show um so i want to delve into some of the characters uh, sure. first catherine um I mean, Elle Fanning's performance is it's such an anchor for this show. Yeah. And yeah. she does such an incredible job at driving the story forward while still giving the audience space to experience the world through the character's eyes. Yeah. Yeah, um, she's incredible. Yeah, can you, can you talk about the casting process for, for, for locking her into that? Because she's so Oh, pivotal. yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty... Um, it was not... Um, what's the word? It was not elaborate. Uh, I just... I think, you know... I. Basically, I knew, I knew on one level I'm making, basically I'm making narrative drama with a comic execution. And the, the bedrock of the narrative drama is her. And so I knew I had to have a great dramatic actress at the heart of it. Mm -hmm. um, 
who had this sense of youth and idealism and was, but it was also funny. And, and, you know, I think I thought she was funny and then she thought at the time, cause she hadn't done a lot of comedy, mm. but I'd seen her do a few things in Ginger and Rose, um, Sally Potter's film when she was 15, that made me kind of pretty sure she could do the comedy. Um, and it was just that really, I just felt like she just, and then I, she read the script and we just had a chat and, um, that was really it. I mean, it was sort of her. I just sort of wanted her and I wanted Nick. And that was sort of it. That was my casting process. And then luckily they read it and both wanted to do it. Um, but it was really that. I mean, the thinking behind it was I needed someone who could anchor the story emotionally, which I knew she could. And also sort of be... Um, sort of from somewhere else. I mean, she's got an incredible presence that's sort of different because her upbringing, you know, she's had a different life from everyone in a way. Mm -hmm. um, so she's sort of, uh, even though she's a very contemporary young woman, she's sort of got a, a sort of difference because her the way she's lived her life is very different from most people. So it was really that. I was just like, who are the, who's the best actors? And then with Nick, it was very much, I met him on The Favourite. Um, and I was just like, he's great. He would be an amazing Peter. And I knew if I could find a great Peter, those, those two anchors for the show are sort of anchor everything. You know, he really anchors the comedy. And so I needed those two things to work. And I, and until I found that, I was a bit like, I don't know, should I do this? But, um, once I found them, I was very like, okay, I can cast it. So I can... Yeah make a make a run at trying to make trying to get it made well yeah on on the topic of nick and peter um i mean that's maybe one of the more fascinating characters i feel like i've seen on screen like ever and i i feel like that's because of this excellent dance that happens between your writing and his performance of it um, yeah i mean yeah i think we're both lucky like I think we both regard ourselves as lucky to have found each other <laughs> um in a way because I think he just I think it's that one of those things where you know even with Al I feel the same way it's like there's points where you just find the right person and I think the three of us really feel that and I think he and I he just gets the comedy he's effortless with it but he brings this level and there's no there's no dramatic thing I can't give him as well uh -huh. you know so so I think for me as a writer, it's having those two, knowing they can do anything, knowing if I give them a nine page two hander, they'll, they'll learn it in 24 hours and come in and have fun and like bang at it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, is there, is there a, a conscious trick that you're playing with that character though? Because he's so simultaneously like reprehensible without being totally um, repulsive. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I don't know what trick I'm playing. I think that's the thing. I, I mean, it's funny because I don't see him as, I mean, I see things he does as reprehensible, but I don't, uh, you know, I don't think anyone's, I think from my point of view as a writer, I just am all, uh, I'm always like, well, how are people driven and why are they doing things? And and if you understand that, I mean, he's sort of unmalicious. He doesn't really understand his own drives. He's sort of like a kid. So there's lots of elements of him that are understandable. And then he does these horrible things and you sort of get it. And he's the way, you know, so it's, it's not forgivable, but there's, there's a way into him, which I think lets an audience like him no matter what he does in a strange way. And, and a lot of that's Nick. I mean, a lot of it's in the writing, but Nick just finds all of it, you know, to let the audience kind of like him enough. And also just that he can, he's so mercurial, you know. Incredibly, it's perfect work for him. And the dance that you two managed to, to perform. Yeah, is yeah, yeah. Dizzying. We do, yeah, we do really love working together. It's really fun. Yeah. So the show's also quite an ensemble piece. I mean, you have like a, a, a pretty big chess set of, of characters that play with one another. Yeah. Um, and everybody is so unique and so well-defined such that when you set them up across from one another, there's a new interesting dynamic that sort of explodes. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's part of it. I mean, I worked really hard on the casting um, because it's the tone thing. Everyone had to be able to, 
you know, there's a lot of really great theatre actors in there. Um, so there was just people, I just wanted people who I felt like understood what I was trying to do and could bring comedy and could be, bring drama and bring both very truthfully. And you've got all those, you know, from Phoebe to yeah. Doug Hodge, Belinda, you know, they're all able to turn that, you know, they can really turn on a dime and hold the comedy and switch up really fast, you know, and make it true if the writing's true. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, totally, you're just being jerked in so many different directions. Yeah. Delightfully so, though. Did you have any pairing of characters that you liked to write more than any other pairing? Was there, was there any person or a pairing that exploded for you? There were, no, I don't know that it exploded, but there were pairings. I, I think on all shows you end up with pairings. You really start to enjoy a lot. Like I really liked, um, obviously, Peter and Catherine are the, the fun, you know, fun pairing. But also I liked pairing like, you know, Velamentov and Catherine was a good pairing. Mm -hmm. And then Aunt Elizabeth and Peter, I really liked their scenes and same with her and Kat, you know, they became really good, unexpected, weird things would happen in their scenes and, uh -huh. um, you know, and then, you know, like Gregor and Joe, you know, that triangle I really loved writing, that was kind of great. So I think what was good about them is they were really like well-drawn, okay, it's like that you could put Archie in a room with the Archbishop in a room with Mario and something weird would happen. So they are, they were like fun. And um, so I really, there was no one, I, I sort of loved writing all of them because they all, as the actors brought more and more to it, it's fun for a showrunner to just pick and pick up and run on some of that stuff. I'm sure. Yeah, it shows. Um, there's also, there's so much going on in this show. Like it's, it's so densely packed. There's, there's satire, there's like philosophical insight. Uh, there's strategic political maneuvering, um, and it makes me almost grateful for commercial breaks uh, at a certain point because I need I need time to digest. Yeah, uh, but like you said at the top of this, this started off as a play uh, at yeah. the Sydney Theatre Company in 2008. Um, yeah, what what has evolved in the story over the course from uh, stage to screen? Well, I guess it's evolved from I think the the play was a sort of two act up, young Catherine, old Catherine. So I think the first act was, which is sort of what the show's based on was 45 minutes or 50 minutes. So, I mean, it's evolved in 10 to 10 hours. Uh, well, you know, there's a few characters added, like, um, and then there's, a, there's just sort of the world's bigger and the kind of like, I think it's, it gives you, the 10 hours just gave me an opportunity to do a lot more with say Peter and add, say, you know, Aunt Elizabeth or add, you know, um, uh, you know, the Gregor and Georgina characters aren't in the play. You know, it was just a matter of a, able, being able to just create a, a more complex, complex world and uh, that I could do more with, in a way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and what was the writing process like for this show? Did you, did you work in the room? Was it you? Uh, it was a bit of both. It was, I... I mean, I'd written the pilot by myself and I'd wrote it, I wrote episode two. Um, and then once we shot the pilot and I delivered ep two and then I greenlit the show, then I had a room, uh, a small room for a while. And yeah, I mean, I worked with the room and they did research and we would just, you know, do what you do, break, break apps. And then that room sort of shrank as we went because I was writing most of the scripts. Um, and then a few writers kind of sort of worked in London with me and so it's yeah so but there's a room I mean it's important a room's really important to me because I don't it just makes your brain bigger you know and mm -hmm. uh so you know there's a you know you kind of pick people who you think will fill gaps or have a different view on the world and um so the, yeah I like having a room you know it's one of the fun things yeah yeah collaboration uh, yeah that's great results um, lastly, before we turn it over to the audience Q and A, um, yeah. I wanted to uh, address the elephant in the room, or, or uh -oh. it's the it's the horse in the oh, room. The horse. Yeah, the horse in the room. <laughs> um, Catherine, you know the infamous rumor around Catherine the Great, uh, of course, which you address in the show, is uh, that she had sex with horses and um, yeah. even died as a result of a complication from from the act. Yeah, um, um, and yeah. I read. 
You go. Yeah. No, no, please. Oh, I read that you almost didn't include that element of the story in the show. Um, and I'm curious to know what your process grappling with that was. Uh, because I think one of the reasons I wanted to make the, write the play in the beginning was I thought, here's the woman with ex who's did these extraordinary things and her whole life was, you know, started women's education and took over a country and kept the enlightenment alive and did all these things, you know, flawed as she was. Um, and all she's known for is maybe she banged a horse, you know. I, I, and so part of me was like, that's, that's what's fucked up about our world. You know, that that can happen to a person. Um, so, so on one level, I was like, so I'm not putting it in. Cause, <laughs> but then as I went, I went, you know what? A, it's a really, it's seminal idea and it's, a, it's what people know about us. So why don't I just find a way to riff on that? And no, and, and it was what it was. I mean, when we did research about it, it was just a, a cartoon put out to sort of smear her, really, um, which seemed kind of a contemporary idea in itself, you know. So then, then I was like, hey, it's a good joke and we'll have fun and let's do it. You, you, yeah, you touch on it in the show in regards to that too. There's this just biting irony of she keeps going around saying, oh, nobody's going to remember that. Nobody's going to remember that. Yeah, yeah. totally. <laughs> no. then, yeah. yeah, here we are. Um, well, kudos to you for, for uh, you. reminding us of uh, what she did contribute to the world. I, I didn't realize that she had also invented roller coasters. Exactly. She did invent roller coasters. She was very uh, science and fun based. So, so anyway, let's turn it over to uh, some audience Q&As. Okay, cool. Uh, we have, this is a good one. Uh, how has the pandemic affected you creatively? And do you have any tips for artists or creators who are struggling to figure out their place in a world that's changing so quickly? Um, hmm. uh, well, I guess it, well, it's, it's sort of a multi-pronged answer. I mean, the pandemic came and sort of made our post-production in a practical sense, very difficult because we were then doing it on Zoom in three different countries. Yeah. Um, and then creatively, I think, it's, I think it's hard to, like all my writer friends, it's very hard to focus for a while there. Even though you would think, oh, what do we care? We're writers, we stay home and write most of the time anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but I found like people found it hard to focus. I mean, I was sort of having a break after the show anyway, but, um, and then the biggest thing for, TV writers is the Zoom room replacing the in-person writers room. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I think that's creatively, I find that very difficult. Um, and, uh, you know, cause it's not a one for one swap. There's such different experiences. And so there's something efficient about them, but that one of the joys of a writer's room is the inefficiency of it because uh, that's where, that's where good ideas to me, that's where good idea come from. They come from the, moments everyone's just sitting around eating donuts and cracking wise and um you know all the downtime in between these flurries of creative activity and that that sort of is hard to get to that doesn't really exist on zoom so i feel like uh that's for me that's a creatively writer room wise tricky i mean you know writing scripts is just you by yourself anyway so mm -hmm. no that's a really good point i was discussing with somebody about uh the, the the nature of the formality of conversations now like we schedule yeah. conversations we're on yeah. and then we're off there's no passing people in the halls yeah i think that's it it's like you break for coffee and everyone shuts down and goes and has coffee but yeah. so whereas once you would break and walk around and have little private conversations and gossip and you know if someone would come back oh we thought this you know but yeah so it is it is a it's a, it's a tough one well, that segues into another audience, Gune. Um, what uh, hobbies have you picked up? How are you spending your, your time in quarantine? Um, I, don't, uh, I don't really have hobbies. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, not really. None. I re none. I've got you kids. You haven't gotten a power dose starter yet? I've got, I've got kids instead of hobbies. Oh, yeah, that's a hobby. Yeah. Um, we have another one from another anonymous attendee. How, uh, what were the differences between writing for a show like The Great and writing for a movie uh, like The Favorite or Ashby? Um, the I guess the differences are, I mean, writing with, 
I mean, I guess on a show like the who, the great, um, you know, it's sort of my show, you know. So it's my car to drive, you know. Um, and on a movie like The Favorite, uh, you know, it's Yorgos's show, you know. So, you know, and we're very collaborative, and he's, you know, just a great, great person to work with. Um, but ultimately, you know, it's his movie, and he's directing the movie, and um, so it's different in that way. I mean, and in the ultimate responsibility is sort of his and um you know i'm working you know and, and we have very much a relationship where i give him and he feeds back and we go through this process but um yeah i think the biggest difference is that that ultimately you're i mean because it sort of becomes with a writer like i deliver the favorite i go to rehearsals i go to set now and again but on this i'm running the show i cast the show i edit the show you know so it's just like a massive difference it's like directing something versus just writing and handing over you know so it's a different experience I mean I like both of them a lot because make writing a film is I I love working with direct good directors you know like um because it's so creatively interesting to me um someone like him and I work with Craig Gillespie and you know just people who are great at what they do and you learn so much and then you know this is you know, this is your other thing, you know, the TV show is a different thing. Yeah. And, and you've mentioned you, you find more fruitful uh, work comes out of collaboration. Yeah. I don't, I, yeah. I'm not scared of it. Cause I, I like it. I think you really learn a lot. And part of it is knowing you got to just got to know your own process. I mean, it's, you got to know yourself, know your process, know your craft. So there's like a circle around that so that you can mm -hmm. collaborate and not get, but you've got to know where you stand about everything to collaborate well. You well, know, to another... be able to... Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry, no, go. I was, was going to say, there's another question asking um, if you would have any advice for someone starting out in the industry and how you started out with your career. So maybe piggybacking on that, how did you come to know yourself as a writer and your, and your, and your process? Um, I'd say, I mean, I just started writing plays and... Um, got luck you know luck I went to a Australian playwrights conference and this really great playwright actually directed my workshop who then became you know helpful in me getting a start but um I mean for me it's I think more and more I just uh I think the biggest change for me in my career was when I started to really focus on my craft and just saw I think when I started to see my craft as just a lifetime learning experience and that there was a lot of joy in that um then i don't know then i that's still what i focus on is that i'll never stop learning my craft because i keep forgetting it <laughs> so i have to relearn it all the time um but that's part of the joy every new thing is a new thing and you've got to learn how to do this thing and then and also it takes a long time to develop a process of that's a bit impermeable to outside influence in a way, you know, you got to listen, but you can easily get overwhelmed as a writer by notes and by opinions. And, and you've got to find a process that, you know, puts a fence around that and is your creative process that you can always trust and that you can believe in no matter what is going on around you, because it's easier to get overwhelmed and, um, pushed into you know into a place where you've lost your way i think as a writer so for me craft is where it all starts and ends you know do you have any uh mistakes from early in your career that 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 like haunt you or that you've learned particularly from uh i don't know that haunt me i mean i've made mistakes of course i think probably the biggest mistake is when you you it's hard when you're young because you want to take, you've got to take jobs and sometimes you take jobs that aren't very good for you. Uh, and some, and the mistake, the regret, which is fine. It's, it's more like when you know you're doing that. It's very um, ominous. Yeah. You sort of know <laughs> instinctively, oh, I shouldn't do this, but it all sounds fine. But you sort of know, I think, I think that's, but that's hard. It's hard to learn to say, you know, I mentor a young writer and, she was struggling yesterday because it's like, how do I say no to things? Cause I say no. And then people talk me into it or I feel bad. I feel guilty. I feel, and I'm like everyone, you know, and every writer in the room was like, yes, all of us, <laughs> you know, it, yeah. it's, it's hard. Cause 
it's a hard road early and I think you've just got to keep the faith as much as you keep the faith slash self delusion, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, we're anybody in the entertainment industry is their own little Don Quixote kind of, kind of running yeah. through the said. Yeah, um, I think so. There, 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 there has to be a balance though, I'm sure between staying true to yourself, but also stretching your experience. Right. Yeah. I think that's what I mean about if you've got a good process that you trust and lets you be creative and you always know you can go back to that then I think you can be more free and creative and um, listen and take jobs. I mean, and I also really believe in taking jobs that you don't think you can, cre that you're creatively capable of. Um, uh, you know, I think that's, that's important to, to just put yourself out there a little bit on like, how, how am I going to bring this off? You know, cause the great was a bit like that. And I think I was just going to say, and the favorite as well was a bit like that. We were a bit like, I, let's just, I don't know, let's just try it, you know? Yeah. And you know, that's what's, you know, that's what's particularly great. You know, that's what he probably taught me is just like, it doesn't matter. You just got to like creatively go as far as you can go and peel yourself back if you feel it. But yeah, he's, he's an incredibly courageous artist in terms of what he's prepared to do. And, um, you know, so you have those experiences where you learn a lot from, you learn a lot from everything, really. You just don't want to get stuck in an experience that's so terrible for too long, you know. Sure, sure. Was there, you, you have such dedication to your craft and such uh, dedication to, to pushing forward and, and breaking new boundaries, but was there, ever, was there ever any other option for you besides writing in your mind? Uh, not once I decided to do it. Not really. I, I mean... Yeah, not really. I mean, I'd had other jobs before I started, but um, nothing I really liked. And then, I, yeah, I don't know. I just, you really have to commit to the idea you're going to succeed. Mm -hmm. uh, I think. I don't, you know, I, I certainly did things that gave me no way back to Such my as? old life. Well, I would just, I would just quit jobs in a really severe way so I would never be allowed back. And then, uh, <laughs> you know, I just, <laughs> And then uh, I just, yeah, I just sort of would do things that I was like, there's no road back now. You have to go forward and make this work. Um, because, it, yeah, I think if you give us, I don't know. I mean, it's, everyone's different. I mean, that's just me. I was like, you know, I'm so, I'm so comfort, hedonistic, lazy that I was probably like, given, given the choice of doing something easy, I would do it. That, uh, I felt like this would be more meaningful if more difficult. So, but I knew myself well enough to know, oh, I did have a job once where I made a lot of money and life was easy, you know, but. But you're talking about like intentionally burning bridges in order to push yourself. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. But depends who you are. I mean, everyone's, I think that's what I mean. Everyone's process is different. You can talk, you know, it's like it's from Sorkin, Michael Arndt, anyone you listen to about how to write a script, there's fundamental uh, things that are the same but everyone has a slightly different take on it and everyone's approach to how they go through their process is different so mm -hmm. you got it that's what i mean about it. you got to create you got to create your own that fits with your personality and stuff makes sense speaking on that um another audience q a wants to know if you were seeking out comedy writers or uh, drama writers in building your room and how you assembled your room um, no, I wasn't really, I mean, I was a little bit, you know, I was seeking out a bit of both. Um, I didn't really, cause I, I knew I would probably write seven or eight of them. So, uh, I wasn't as much as anything, I'm seeking out points of view and the way people think. Mm. Um, yeah, I, you know, I needed, I had experienced comedy drama writers like James Wood and, um, Tess, but. I think I was also, I was more like, I want someone who's really about politics and really hard edge contemporary politics. Mm. And I want someone, you know, this show's about a young woman. I want, you know, really good, young, fresh writers who have a voice who will argue with me and give a strong young woman's perspective, contemporary perspective on everything we do. Uh, so I would take that and then I would want someone who's like a James who was very experienced who could just kind of help me make sure the architecture of it all was good as well as bringing, a, you know, he had a very period drama view of the world. So 
I just try and pick the gaps in me and fill them, you know, mm-hmm. with mm-hmm. people who I think are brilliant and funny. And, uh, and then some, some people write it, you know, and that's just generally they've got to be strong in both. They've got to be strong in drama and they've got to be strong in comedy. And uh, so, yeah, that's how I sort of look at it. Interesting. Um, we have another audience Q and A asking about the difference between uh, breaking a story for three act structure versus breaking it for uh, a ten episode series. Um, I, I, I don't. I don't know. I mean, to me, there isn't much difference. I mean, I just I probably break the ten hours as a three act structure. So you're, you're so democratic with story, which I, which I love. Uh, that's like what makes the great so. It's this, it's this blend of, of history and, and, and narrative. You, you, you're really egalitarian in your approach, it seems. I guess so, yeah. I don't, uh, I don't know. I mean, you mean everyone gets a go or what? How do you mean democratic? I mean, every mode of storytelling gets oh, yeah. uh, used. You, you, don't, you don't confine yourself to any sort of um, rules, basically. No, no, that's true. No, I don't because I, I, uh, I just live in life. I don't see life constraining itself to any set of rules. So I'm reflecting life. You know, I'm like, these are people living lives. I mean, look at our contemporary life. It's not playing a lot of rules for us, is it? So I think I look at it that way. I'm just like, well, and also it's a, you know, it's a genre that I feel like is pretty ripe for um, change and, and, and offers a lot. I think it offers a lot. I think it was a genre that just offered a lot of things that weren't being as utilized as they could have been. Yeah. yeah. Well, you've certainly managed to find uh, new sounds and new keys to play, which are uh, delightful to watch and incredibly enlightening. I see that you have your keys and... Uh, yeah, sorry. No, that was <laughs> no, it's fine. It's fine. I know you had to be out of here at 345. Um, yeah, yeah. That's so cool. we, can, we can do one more question real let's, quick before you go. Let's do one more. Yeah. Um, what have... Or, no, let's do this. It'll be a good uh, look towards the future. What are you working on next? Uh, well, I'm in the midst of, I don't know, week six of season two, Brighter's Room, uh, which we start shooting at the end of the year. And uh, I've written a movie for Yorgos, which we're shooting next year and, um, uh, and about to write another one for him. Um, and what else? Yeah, I mean... And writing, in a, yeah, just writing a few movies and doing this and um, just that's it, really. Just a few movies. Uh, not really productive <laughs> in quarantine. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, thank um, you so much for your time. Uh, thank you so much for gifting the world with the great and for reviving uh, such an incredible character and uh, replacing her in our consciousness. Well, thank you very much. That's very nice of you to say. Yeah, yeah. Well, you're the one that put more time into it. I just got to watch it. <laughs> so, uh, every episode of The Great is currently streaming on Hulu, where you can watch it and uh, be dazzled. Um, Tony, huzzah. Thank you so huzzah. much. Thank you very much. And have uh, a good day. Indeed. Have a good day.